The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about urban transportation. Now, this is something that is absolutely critical to modern Africa, in part because Africa now is urbanizing faster than almost anywhere else in the world. And it's really a very interesting phenomenon because as more people come into the cities, these cities are becoming far more congested. And overall economic activity tends to slow down if people can't get from point A to point B easily and efficiently. Now, it's interesting because the first time that I was in China back in 1989 and then lived here for much of the 1990s, uh, the situation here in China was identical to what it is today in Africa. And now, 30 some odd years later, China by far is one of the world's leaders when it comes to urban transportation. There is every mode of transportation that you can imagine uh, from you know high-speed trains to urban buses to you name it, the motorbikes, rent-a-bikes, everything is here. And they have done it so efficiently. So it begs the question, that as China is spending so much money on African infrastructure development, are there in fact lessons that can be learned from what China's gone through over the past 30 years? Yes, and the lessons particularly relate to not only to development, but also to ecological management. Because, you know, China, China's development has been a massive success, but in, in ecologically it faced a lot of challenges. Um, and China has, has then been quite successful in reshaping its development to try and chase more ecological goals. You know, they, 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 they have mixed success, you know, and obviously the air in Beijing is still not wonderful. But, you know, China is also a very big investor in green infrastructure. And so the question for Africa is how, how do you, not only how do you develop, but how do you develop without recreating some of the problems that China experienced? Um, how do you use some of the lessons from China to leapfrog into ecologically sustainable, clean development. So that's the key word here, which is leapfrogging. And if we look at the recent, say, the past 20 years of Chinese economic development, leapfrogging is one of the key themes, whether it's on e-commerce, transportation, uh, urbanization. In so many ways, China has had the benefit of not being burdened down by legacy systems. So that's the that was the theme that came out last December in a fascinating paper by, you know, Saya, your 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 home institution, Cobus, can Africa build greener infrastructure while speeding up its development? And these are some lessons from China. It was written by Dr. Lauren Johnson, who is a friend of the program. We talked about uh, demographics with her uh, last year, or maybe was it last year or earlier this year on 2019. But it was a fascinating show about African demographics, which is very much related to the discussion today on urban transportation. And she co-wrote that with uh, Robert Early, who's the founder of EQ Consulting in Beijing, China, and an advisory firm on sustainable transportation and infrastructure in Asia. And Kobus, you had the chance to speak with Rob about what the lessons are and the opportunities that Africa can leverage from China's experience in sustainable urban transportation. Let's take a listen. So, Rob, let's start by by um, having you tell us a little bit about your own work. Like, what, what do you usually focus on in your research? Well, my work focuses generally on sustainable transportation. I have uh, I'm a, I have a background in environmental science and in urban and regional planning uh, from my studies in Canada. Uh, but after I moved to China. I started looking first at uh, efficient vehicles in China. Uh, we worked on fuel economy policy for uh, the Chinese automotive market as well as on sustainable biofuels. And after that, uh, I moved into more sustainable freight and logistics. And slowly over time, uh, I've expanded uh, my focus of work into uh, the general concepts of 
uh, sustainable transportation that could be applied to freight and logistics, could be applied to passenger uh, transportation, uh, urban transportation, and, and, and other areas. So right now I'm an independent consultant, and I work with a number of various agencies, um, both in China and across Asia, for promoting uh, sustainable transportation. So the the kind of core idea of the paper that we worked on together was that um, that Africa can take some you know lessons about positive and negative lessons, or you know um, can take lessons from from China's experience in putting in massive amounts of of transportation infrastructure, both in terms of what China got right and what they got wrong. Um, so so can you give us an idea of like what what are some of the things that China got wrong in the rollout of this of this infrastructure? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, you know every time you roll out infrastructure, you're going to get even in the same project, some of those things are going to work out well and some things are going to work out less well. So any particular project might have a very good economic out- outcome, but it might have a very bad uh, outcome for the um, transportation situation of a city. I'd say that one of the big mistakes or possibly drawbacks of some of the Chinese development in the earlier stages was the focus on automobiles as the main mode of transportation in cities. Uh, Now we see in cities that there's a huge amount of congestion. And at the same time, there's still a lack of focus on, uh, on the public transportation infrastructure, even with the masses of uh, massive amounts of public infrastructure that are being built for public transport, there's still not enough. Um, I think one particular case that comes to mind is that uh, when Beijing opened the Line 5 subway, it was operating at capacity on the first day that it was, uh, as soon as it opened. So there was clearly a huge demand for transportation. And at the same time, we still have a lot of this car-based infrastructure that um, that encourages people to buy cars, to drive them, and to get stuck in traffic, which which isn't really ideal. So in in Africa, you frequently have a situation where you know there the, there is a road system, um, but it's it's a very dilapidated one, um, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of um, of public and political pressure to to improve roads, to upgrade them, and to expand them. Um, you know, you you make the point in the paper that that actually frequently doesn't solve the problem. Um, why why is that? There is something to be said for properly maintaining the infrastructure that you have. Indeed, people need to travel around cities. And if you only have uh, roads to get around, then at least the ones that you have should be properly maintained. So I, I, can, I can agree with people's frustration that, that roads are not being maintained. However, there's, uh, there's always this concept by uh, certain parties in society that you, you, if, if, the, if you have a lot of traffic, that you need to make the roads wider and that you need more roads. This is true to an extent, especially in the early stages of development when when the whole society needs as much transport capacity because there is none. But uh, also in the early stages, we find that the more roads that you build, the more demand that you have for transport. So it's the roads that create the demand for transportation. And no matter what, the demand for those roads is insatiable. There have been cases now in in uh, cities in Western countries or even, say, in South Korea, where they started removing roads from cities and they found that the demand just disappears. So we can see that uh, it's it's not the lack of infrastructure necessarily that causes traffic, but it's it's a uh, it's the demand that's caused by infrastructure that that causes traffic. There's there's a lesson to be learned here in that if we can put that demand into public transportation, then we can get cities that are more compact. We can get cities that have uh, cleaner uh, air because they don't have so many uh, cars traveling on there. And, And we can get cities that have a better attitude towards the social aspect of public transportation. One of one of the you know one of the challenges that that I think makes China an interesting case study for Africa 
is that a lot of the Chinese mass transit systems, especially urban mass transit systems, were were really put in relatively late. You know, in 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 a you know, I lived in Japan for a while, and and you know, in in in. Tokyo, for example, frequently they put in the rail lines, the subway lines before the suburbs, you know, so so that the, the lines went in and then the suburbs essentially developed around them in some cases. Um, in the case of China, frequently those, those systems were relatively late, which is also the same in Africa. So you already have a big congested city and then you need to try and put on, put in a, a kind of urban transportation system uh, within an already congested city, um, what kind of lessons do you think Africa can take from from the Chinese experience of developing these systems? Well, the first thing that I want to point out here is that uh, the 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 model that you described in Japan was a, definitely a conscious model that was developed by the private sector. Uh, it's known as the Kobayashi uh, model of of uh, transport oriented uh, development, transit oriented development. And it was a conscious uh, model that was developed by a businessman. And then he was given rights uh, and ability by municipal governments to build up the density around certain uh, nodes of transport. I think that even in existing cities, uh, you get areas that need to be uh, renewed or refreshed. And they're there are different approaches to doing this. I mean, in some cases, uh, you know, you, you would get a developer that's purchasing a whole block of land, and then you, the developer can negotiate with the city if they're going to have public transport or a subway station there to allow them to have, say, a higher density um, uh, rights to do higher density development there that creates the traffic for the public transit system. I think that's definitely a model, even in urban uh, regeneration, that, that can occur. And it doesn't have to be a train system. It can be a bus rapid transit system that we saw very successfully uh, in, in the case of Guangzhou, for example, where you can see the development of part of downtown Guangzhou is in the shape of, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, bus rapid transit system that was installed there at a, at, at a very... Uh, attractive cost to uh, to the city. Um, I, I think that in, in terms of uh, what some other cities have done in China uh, has been less, uh, is trying to follow this concept of uh, land value capture, but it's done by the public sector, very much so by the pu public sector. And uh, and it's not done so much in conjunction with uh, the developers. So the public sector might have an idea about how it wants the city to develop, but the developers don't see the value in, say, creating the density around stations. So we can see that there's some, some stations that don't create that density in, in other cities around China. One of the, I think one of, one of the big issues, um, you know, when when Africa African countries look at the the kind of calculus um, involved in setting up these systems is who's going to pay for it and to which extent is it going to balloon national debt? Um, so you know, obviously, I think you know China had this kind of massive roll out of 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 not only urban rail but long distance rail, um, and you know. It, fabulously expensive kind of thing to do I think for any country um, you pointed out that in that per kilometer high high speed rail in China is actually quite a lot cheaper than in other countries um, what are some of the of the factors involved that actually made it cheaper yeah the Chinese high speed high speed rail is considerably cheaper than in other countries um, I think a World Bank report found that uh, the Chinese high-speed rail costs between $1 and $21 million per kilometer, as opposed to $25 to $39 million per kilometer in Europe, or even estimates of up to $56 million or more per kilometer in the U.S. Um, I think that the, there are uh, good reasons for this that have parallels in, in Africa as it is right now. And the first of it might be the relatively low cost of labor in China, especially at the time when they were rolling out the largest part of the high-speed rail system. Uh, 
and as well as the relatively low cost of residential location uh, relocation. Um, and, and the other parts that uh, I'm not sure have parallels or not are, are the ability to do the larger scale planning in China and to make sure that uh, the, the companies that are manufacturing the, the prefabricated rail parts have a huge amount of, uh, uh, you know, huge economies of scale to, to manufacture at. Uh, but in China also we saw the standardization of many design elements of rail construction and and there were also some issues of financial creativity that allowed for very long time horizons uh, on the repayment of projects uh, through the kind of financing that uh, the Chinese government is able to provide itself domestically. So there were a number of reasons why it was relatively cheap in China. But I think that uh, especially the cost of labor and the relatively low cost of relocating people was a, a very big thing. And then the standardization that China was able to achieve in its, uh, in its prefabrication of, of uh, rail parts. And I, I think that's a really interesting uh, development uh, that could be taken to other countries. Um, this idea of how to do standardization and how to do prefabrication, uh, whether that's done in China or whether that is done uh, in the countries where the uh, where the rail development is occurring. It, it could be a very good opportunity to bring Chinese expertise and investment to build factories in, uh, say, African countries or, or, or wherever they might go to create employment and to create some measure of expertise in those countries on how to make those uh, prefabricated parts and get them quickly into the market. Well, I can definitely see that part of the of the equation being very popular in Africa. I think the relocation of people part might be a lot more complicated. Um, why why is it so so much cheaper to relocate people in China than elsewhere? I think in China, one of the biggest factors in the low cost of relocation is is probably having to do with uh, that the people don't have so much ability to say no to being relocated. Uh, but also that government is very willing to provide uh, some manner of compensation quickly or willing to provide alternative uh, housing or land arrangements uh, as, as becomes necessary in, in order to relocate people. Uh, in, in the paper, you, you make the point um, that, that coastal development zones you know, are are quite important in 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 the history of of Chinese infrastructure provision for development. So, you know, obviously we've seen this we've seen this model pop up a lot in Africa. You know, and there's um where there's a, a special economic zone linked to a port. You know, and then um and free and frequently things that are you know industries are located in that zone, and then they are you know also connected to the port quite intimately. Um, why has that become such a such a central model um, in Chinese development? And and do you feel that that model is is a, kind of applicable to other contexts outside of China? Okay, I think that this concept of setting up a big hub uh, port cities is successful in China uh, because it allows various cities to uh, quickly set up expertise in certain industries and to uh, make sure that the export oriented economy can quickly move products uh, from from uh, being manufactured out into the international markets. Um, I think that it was a, a very good strategy for China at that time because the population in Ch China was very mobile. Uh, even though people may have not been particularly well educated uh, or were coming from the countryside to have their first jobs in an urban environment, having those uh, centers of uh, expertise in manufacturing goods or um, or, or whatever they 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 were uh, focusing on uh, just had made it made for a very good cycle of getting uh, people into factories into jobs scaling up quickly and and exporting to the global market in relation to to this model um, obviously the model has been the, the the connecting of of these domestic industries to the global market has been incredibly successful you know in in terms of economic growth um, and I think in, in Africa we see a lot of a lot of governments being very interested in in you know in taking taking 
notes from that part of the model, um, you know, and, and trying to apply them to Africa. The the other side of the story has been the environmental side, um, you know, and that is lit- that is the one, you know, from from seen from the outside, it, China's environmental image is generally quite a negative one. You know, we I, I think that the 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 idea of like hazy cities, incredibly polluted waterways, the, you know, this is this is a, a kind of a strong perception of 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 the environmental cost of Chinese development. How how um, realistic or how, how up to date do you feel is that image now? Like how, how successful has China been in mitigating the environmental impact of its own development? Okay, that's a really good question. And in fact, uh, China in the, well, since about 2012, when the air apocalypse happened in Beijing and the public outcry occurred, uh, China has taken... Um, uh, basically, a, it's a it's a battle to defend the blue skies, and that's even an, an official term here in China, where where there's taken they're taking a multifaceted approach to uh, discovering sources of pollution, uh, to discovering the reasons that those are sources of pollution, uh, to ensuring that those uh, companies that are polluting are being shut down or or uh, improved. At the same time, the transportation infrastructure is, uh, and the industry at large is, is uh, receiving a lot of pressure to, first of all, uh, decrease the emissions from uh, conventional vehicles. So now the, the China has uh, rolled out the China 6 standard for diesel vehicles, which is even more stringent in some ways than European and U.S. emission standards for, for diesel trucks. Um, at the same time, there's a big push for electrification of transport, uh, both for passenger vehicles, for public transport buses, for the railway. And now uh, even we see in, in Shenzhen a plan to replace all of the urban uh, freight vehicles with electric vehicles uh, in the next few years. In Beijing, in Shanghai, we also see uh, higher, higher and higher numbers of electric trucks delivering goods. And uh, even uh, in some cases, uh, there are uh, fossil fuel trucks that are not allowed to enter cities uh, because of their, their emission levels. Um, I, and and uh, as I said, it's a very multifaceted approach. Um, and it has had a big impact, I think, on industries. But uh, there's definitely the political impetus to clean up and clean up quickly. So obviously that is happening in a context, in a political context of, of quite powerful central control um, and also of uh, where, where the, the, the greater population is, is squarely behind the, the, this kind of project of cleaning up the air. Um, what do you feel in, in other systems that are, where, that are you know, somewhat... Where, where there are other priorities, like for example, job creation or poverty alleviation, you know, being two very big ones, uh, political kind of hot potatoes in, in Africa. Um, what are some of the the low hanging fruit that that societies that are not as technologically advanced as China can take from the Chinese example? Well, I think um, you know my co-author, uh, Dr. Lauren Johnston, she made the uh, point that. Africa is in the middle of this window of opportunity in terms of demographics, where there is very uh, low cost of labor and availability of labor that can be put into large projects. So in, in, in one way, a low-hanging fruit is to start building infrastructure that can move people and goods uh, long distances uh, either between uh, in, in interior to the coast or along the coast, and to get people connected uh, through both by people to people contact and, and personal mobility, as well as through the, the movement of goods. This is a low hanging fruit right now for Africa, and it is definitely an opportunity uh, to develop. But there are some other uh, low hanging fruits that. Uh, I think China and and its own development direction and its economy kind of brings. For example, uh, uh, China is really focusing on electrification of the transport sector. 
And although we see uh, electric vehicles as something kind of expensive right now and maybe not as useful in some cases as fossil fuel, uh, fuel vehicles, we can also see that there are low-cost electric vehicles that can be used for urban delivery that are quiet and very clean. So maybe three, three-wheeled trucks or three-wheeled, uh, uh, like, small, uh, small vehicles for uh, people to ride on in cities that are, that are really useful. And, and uh, when they come with uh, appropriate uh, charging infrastructure that can just be a simple plug in the wall, they actually can contribute to a much cleaner environment in a very fast way. I would say that if... Uh, if there's an opportunity to develop electric vehicles in uh, some cities in Africa, we would see that people would become used to the concept of electric vehicles and would demand them because they are cleaner and quieter and easier to maintain for that matter. Um, I I wanted to uh, highlight one project that I became uh, sort of aware of and involved in called Mobility for Africa, uh, which has been importing three-wheeled uh, trucks uh, into sub-Saharan Africa, along with the solar-powered recharge stations and a small business model for, uh, say, s- swapping of batteries. Uh, I think that the main focus has been in rural communities uh, where fuel might not be available, but you can bring a uh, prefabricated uh, container with solar panels on the top to do the charging of these batteries. And I think it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity to spread or to get people used to the concept of renewable energy being available for transport all the time, and that these vehicles can be shared by, especially by women in the case of this particular project, to, uh, to improve uh, the, the status of their, their family, to get extra income, uh, to get kids to school and to carry heavy items like uh, like water and food or firewood. So I think uh, the fact that China manufactures these goods at a very low cost, just like China manufactures uh, other things like prefabricated rail lines and all this kind of stuff at a low cost, can be used in different areas of, of Africa for uh, doing different things. We can get we can take advantage of the low-cost uh, concept of, of uh, manufacturing in China and apply that to very various places in Africa to uh, sort of leapfrog maybe uh, what has happened in the West and what happened in China in, in the early years and avoid some of those high-polluting industries. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Um, Robert, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Um, if, if people want to follow you on social media, um, I know you're, you're based in China, so that might be a bit complicated, but is there a way for where people can keep, keep up with what, what you're working on at the moment? Um, well, I, I, I am on Twitter uh, from time to time. Actually, that's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm mostly available on WeChat. <laughs> uh, so, um, how how should people search for you on WeChat? Well, I could be added on WeChat at uh, Ma Luo Bo, M A L U O B O, and that's the best way to add me if uh, you'd like to be in touch. And um, well, thank you so much for joining. It was super interesting to discuss this with you. Yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity, Kobus, and uh, I, I uh, look forward to uh, hearing all of your blogs. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Kobus, we began our discussion at the top of the show with this idea of leapfrogging. And at the end of your discussion with Rob, it was, again, all about leapfrogging. And I am so glad that you guys talked about uh, electrification. And one of the things that anybody who comes to China, the first thing that they see right off the bat is how quiet the streets are. Buses are electrified in cities like Shanghai in particular, or or Shenzhen especially. Uh, But the motorbikes are electrified. And, and that is something I think that is key. And the lesson that China can bring here to Africa, I think, is on the electrification of this micromobility, tricycles, motorbikes, scooters, and those things. And the cost of ownership for these bikes is much, much less. That being said, you know, in other developing countries like Vietnam, where people rely on motorbikes, uh, they have been very slow to pick it up. And I, I can't really figure out why there's this idea that 
the motorbikes can't handle the heavy rains or the dirt. That's no longer true. You see people here wading through, uh, you know, almost a meter of water sometimes in in motorbikes. Uh, so the bikes now are not what they were a few years ago. And that, to me, was one of the key points that you brought up with Rob. Yes, that, that's exactly what struck me last time I was in China as well. There were all of these little little electric kind of vehicles used to to move small amounts of freight, for example, to do deliveries. And I kept thinking, wow, these would be incredible in Africa, um, especially because they can, you know, they, they don't contribute to air pollution. They can just be recharged. Um, if you can, if you can scale the production in order to make them cheap enough, they would be a real game changer in Africa. Um, and I think, I think, you know, one of one of the reasons why they became so effective in China is because the Chinese government switched over their, their um, certification system to make it much easier to register electric vehicles and actually much harder to register gas vehicles. Um, so, so you see a kind of a combination of a rollout of industrial, uh, you know, industrial production where all of these products are, are mass produced uh, to on a scale that actually makes them cheaper, together with this kind of, you know, kind of echo in, 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 in the way that, that policy is designed. Um, and, you know, yeah. so, so I, think, I think the way that those two work together, that, that itself could be a lesson for other countries. No, I mean, you, that is a very, very key point. And that's something that I was thinking about as I was listening to your discussion with Rob, was one of the things that works really well here in China is the coordination between the public sector and the private sector on development. So, for example, in Ho Chi Minh City, where I've lived for a long time, uh, developers will build huge apartment buildings, but the government won't build big roads going into those apartment buildings. So now all of a sudden on the same existing roads, you've got 10,000 new residents <laughs> that are living in these apartment buildings. So the congestion on the streets is just a nightmare. And this is something I've seen in Africa quite a bit as well, is that the policy coordination between the private investment and the public sector just isn't there. And it's one of the areas where I think China's done exceptionally well that they build the roads and then the developments come in coordination, whether it's the subways that also are built into it. So a housing development will then have a subway station underneath, and that was built from the master plan. Now, of course, there are things that you can do in China that you simply can't do anywhere else, or at least in most dem democratic countries. And what their ability to move people and to force people to do things that they don't necessarily want, they don't have... Uh, non-state actor uh, civil society stakeholders that they have to contend with in the same way. There are, they are here, but they're not the same way. And at the end of the day, the state and the party uh, have much more power to, to do what they want to do. So I think we don't want to make it a panacea that everything that China does can be replicated in a place like Kenya, Botswana, or Ghana. But there are parts of it that certainly can. And in many ways, I think it does represent a development model that is closer to the realities on the ground in places like Africa than what we see in the West. Yeah, I completely agree. It also raises... I think really important questions um, that I think we, not just the two of us, but like I think people as a whole tend to find difficult to address actually, which is a how are we going to solve all of this all of this kind of the, the rising tide of global warming um, while maintaining democracy. I think that that's a really important kind of philosophical question. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, Africa is facing a, a, another massive challenge, which is, you know, demographics. It has a very large, young population, and those people need to get jobs. So that saving us from global warming and giving those people jobs, that needs, you know, those two problems need to be solved in through one strategy, through a unified strategy strategy. Um, and that raises a lot of questions about what society is going to look like while you are just solving those two problems. So these are the very questions that we're going to start undertaking more on the podcast and on our website at ChinaAfricaProject.com, thinking more about what sustainability feels like in a more holistic concept. So it's sustainability both in terms of ecological and financial, but also in the political context as well, as Kobus pointed out, how can democracy and freedom also go along with this so that people are have more freedom of movement, but also at the same time do not compromise their civil and political rights as well. It's something very, very interesting that we're going to start thinking about a little bit more. We've neglected this in the past, but I think given the the rapid pace of infrastructure development that's starting to happen now in Africa, we're going to look at it a lot more, and particularly what is 
the Chinese influence on that because it gets really interesting when we think about the political side of all of that too. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. If you want to reach out to me or to Cobus, uh, we're easily accessible. You can email us at eric at chinaafricaproject.com or Cobus at Cobus, C-O-B-U-S, Cobus, I get that wrong every <laughs> single week, C-O-B-U-S at chinaafricaproject.com. Uh, Also, be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter that comes out every Monday. Uh, We select the best stories of the week and we push it out uh, every Monday. It's free. Sign up on our website at ChinaAfricaProject.com. So we'll be back again next week. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to Facebook.com slash ChinaAfricaProject to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Studinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.